Buenos días. Good morning. Let's now start this final panel because we are running late behind our schedule. The schedule. This light, the last panel will approach the Spanish law development and challenges, and it's a true pleasure for me to, to introduce it with such good company. We will continue the order we have in our program for the uh, presentations, and I would kindly ask my fellow panelists to use maximum 15 minutes. So with no further ado, uh, I would like to introduce Judge Baltasar Garzón. Uh, in the world introducing that uh, everyone know, introducing a person that everyone knows like an oxymoron, isn't it? As you all know, he has he's been in, involved in the area of fighting against impunity and serious personal consequences. But currently, he still uh, plays an intense role in the area of the struggle against uh, impunity through his own foundation. And the most recent piece of information is counseling the International uh, Court and the, the Committee of Prevention of the Council of Europe. The most recent one is. Uh, in the year 2019, since 2019, as the president in Europe for the World Jurist Association. So, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Judge Garthon. Thank you very much. When I reach 15 minutes, you stop me. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. I believe we have to celebrate that for, at last we have a legal instrument that was necessary. And what being necessary, it also gathers part of the big aspirations that both the memorialist uh, movements as well as activist movements, as well as victims and experts have uh, requested, as years have gone by, Law 20, 2022, 19 uh, of October is, uh, in, is part of the group of laws that in, or regulations that in different countries are anchored or have anchored or, or stem from the conventional law and international law of human rights humanitarian law, etc., for each one of the uh, basic principles that uh, since uh, or for the last uh, 40 years have been, or initiatives have been developed in the different uh, countries. We have to make a brief uh, mention to the law of historic memory of the year 2007, uh, which uh, at that time was a very important milestone in a country like ours, where after dictatorship, after the transition, we still had to wait until uh, December 2007 so that that law could see the light with many restrictions, but still now we have had to wait even more in the area of justice and in the sphere of truth. Maybe with uh, that law, we'll be able to start uh, uh, seeing the fulfillment of the basic principles of uh, in the international law and uh, the human right to memory, to truth, to justice, and to compensation and guarantees of non-repetition. At least, as I said, this law is based on those principles and on the recommendations that all international organizations such as uh, the uh, Rapporteur of Truth, Memory and Justice Repair and uh, Guarantees of Non-Repetition, the Council of Europe, the Committee of uh, Forced Disappearing of People, the different organizations, both from the Council of Europe as well as other institutions, well, they uh, define what should a law of uh, democratic memory be like. 
Lo importante What is important is to point eh, out la y la the necessity de esta norma. of this rule, Bien of this norm. Se As you know, whenever any initiative is criticized, an initiative that is related to the democratic España, memory in Spain, uh, one al, tends to la denominación o a la afirmación de que See, the, the statement that this is reopening old wounds is a law that is not necessary well in that very same discourse we see the need the need, uh, its own need what is the uh, fundamental advance as far as I am concerned with this number with respect to the law of December the year 2007 well That is, that we go from a, uh, an existential uh, state that is what was represented in that rule, offering a support, subventions whenever uh, or, or when they were uh, eliminated, when, as, when, uh, as we could see, the year 2011 uh, with Mr. Rajoy's government, to an active, uh, proactive state, accepting this law, imposing the state the obligation of being proactive in the implementation and development of the law while creating institutions, while creating mechanisms that necessarily involve uh, the state in, a, um, in, in an action or activity which is proactive in its own nature. Memory, as we all know, is something that has to do with the present and future. Though some people criticize it by saying that this is part of the past and that it's not contributing with anything it creates as a society, as a people, as a, with a level of solidarity so that the future is more integrative and, and diverse. It's known what happened, the effects that have taken place due to the inexistence of that rule and those that are still here to come. With the law of democratic memory 20-22, the state, as I said, accepts and embodies the, the role of supporting the rule while protecting the victims in the spheres as that were mentioned of truth, justice, repair and guarantees of non-repetition, incorporating the recommendations and adding a fundamental element that, as you may well remember, was the object of a debate with respect to the law of amnesty of uh, 1987, October 1987, about the, the debate that uh, asked for the derogation of the law, plus others that defended that it was not necessary to have derogation. And finally, it was uh, included a mention in Article 2 of that law that clearly states what is the intention of that law. If you allow me to, to do so, remembering my own personal history, in one way or another, even if uh, quite a few years have gone by since the year 2008, when I decided that uh, we had to research uh, and investigate the, the Frank, uh, Frankest uh, Franco's uh, crimes in, in the 18th of uh, December and, uh, this uh, the same year that did not prosper and it actually gave rise to, to a, a, a penal procedure uh, stopping me or uh, my activity as a, a judge in that resolution well, there we could see some arguments that now are law in one way or another that some kind of a poetic justice beyond the fact that, uh, uh, that well, I was, I was right uh, and that statement came from the UN because the current government is not really bothering uh, on, on how to repair my case for example that's a different story that's not today's story but definitely it's important to, to understand 
that the arguments given about the law amnesty, in my case, was what now is seen in the law. It was not necessary to, to derogate the law, but simply it was important to see or to, to the interpretation of regular a rule that can never be an obstacle in order to investigate crimes of uh, money, that uh, war crimes, international crimes, as uh, the crimes uh, referred to to the civil war and during the Franco's dictatorship, which, as you may well know, and if not, I'll tell you, this law declared uh, this illegal both the war as a consequence of a coup d'etat of 1936 and the further uh, dictatorship in all its, its extension embodying each one of the institutions and actions that uh, took place uh, from society, justice society, and each one of the organizations that during that time uh, generated the constant and permanent repression of victims. We have topics that will be observed, that, have, that has to do with the prescription, the, 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 who are, are all uh, have all the, the uh, facts uh, prescribed? Are they all inter international crimes? Well, some of them, since since 1945, um, after the Nuremberg or Tokyo, um, uh, we could say, well, there we have the interpretation. And then the law determines the right to investigation. It's uh, the right of victims. We put the victim right at the core. It's the fundamental backbone that right at this moment changes what the conception and, and the concept and what has to be after the 19th of October of the year 2022. I remember that when I said we have to investigate, uh, I was not inventing uh, things. I was implementing the international uh, principles to international law. We have to protect victims. We have to guarantee the right to investigation. And then let's decide. Then let's decide if there is a penal responsibility or if there is no such thing because uh, well, you know, the results will be or dead or whatever. But investigation is a right. This law gathers that, that right. This is fundamental inside the institutions that create that create the law itself. One of the main, uh, it's, I think it's Article 48, uh, and there's a fifth uh, addendum. Well, in any case, we have the uh, Office of, of uh, Human Rights and democratic memory. This, is, this office is a fundamental uh, institution. It generated a great deal of debate. Well, there's a, a, the, we have a threat. If uh, the government uh, changed in the coming uh, elections, the popular party, not to mention uh, far uh, right wing, uh, because they manifest uh, on, on, on over the 20th, did so with no obstacle, well, they will say, we will derogate the law. That's what they say. Derogating laws are not so easy, and uh, leaving the institutions without uh, power is not so that easy either. But this institution, this uh, office, considering the competences it has, is fundamental not only in the democratic memory, but also in human rights. It connects the law with the defense of human rights and the coordination of the fiscal ministry in the struggle for human rights, linking it to the democratic memory. It's very important to see that link because on, up until now, it seemed like these were two different worlds. Let's say that the Spanish legislative initiative that maybe you didn't 
notice this in, in all its in, in extensions, connects this element to, to the rest. It gives it a very wide scope. The competences of that office are described in that law, but they are open enough as to let the development following that principle of defense of the victim and not the other way around, as up until now we heard. We see that they, they have to well, participate in exhumations, of course. And it doesn't mean anything. Some people say, well, when you read the law with that perspective of uh, putting the victim right at the core of it all, we'll see that the competences are very important. And all this, all this connected to the right to investigation will indicate where we are standing and where the law should reach, or how far the law should reach. This law can be nothing, or maybe nothing, if there's not a will to develop the principles in the line that I am now using without a shade of a doubt. We, uh, my foundation and, and many others, uh, many of the movies are part of the platform of defense of the Commission of the Truth. Uh, law doesn't speak about the Commission of Truth, but it does speak about a body called uh, Commission of Experts that uh, determines some some terms on uh, how and when everything should be caused and how it all should be uh, developed. Uh, so it recognizes the right to truth through that mechanic. Uh, through the, the mechanics of, of the commission that some people call the commission of truth and others call it a technical commission determining different spheres, expert spheres in the area of economic repair and compensation. It's very important. It is true that the, uh, the law suggests that a re direct reivindication will take place, but uh, through the mechanism and through the commission of experts, that it's established that there should be an audit that should determine how and in and, and what way the, the, the claims should be accepted and done. Well, the mechanic of it, uh, of action is, is, is will have some obstacles, but there are ways through or inside the law that will allow this to, to progress if the interpretation, as I said, follows the line of integral protection of the victim. And as I was told that I had exceeded my, my time, I'll stop here. Maybe if there are any questions, uh, I'll answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much with all these considerations and for, for being so strict with your time. Well, now, let me give the floor to Juan Carlos García Bravo representing the Association of Social and Democratic Memory, AMSD, where they work on the legislation on the memory. One of the issues, the most, uh, or the newest issues in, in the lines uh, that they try to open up in the uh, different activities of history and memory after the different uh, governments wants to actively participate in the creation of the platform of the Commission of Truth where 100 organizations take place actively and well, you have the floor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for your kind invitation to these work days. I will try to summarize the position of my association, AMESDE, about the new law of democratic memory. Let me start with context uh, uh, and history, because in the context we have to determine the two debates that have been produced on the 14th of July in the Congress and the 5th of October in the Senate. In both debates, the right wing adopted a position that we are used to, which was nearly wild. They, they, uh, accused people, they nearly insulted everyone, and it was most uh, bizarre. They praised, constantly praised the Constitution of 1978 and the period of the democratic, so-called democratic transition, while accusing uh, 
the speakers, those that propose uh, that law, and they were accused of betraying both the Constitution 1978 as well as the, as well as the um, agreement or the transition agreement on the first component, the supposed betrayal of the left wing that took place as a consequence of having approved that law. Well, it's paradoxical that those that are not systematically fulfilling the law with the renewal of the judiciary power or is accusing others of such non-fulfillment. But also, if we go to the origin, the Constitution of 1978 and the votation that took place initially in the Congress or, 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 the member, or in the Parliament, out of the 16 uh, parliamentary of Alianza Popular, which were the predecessors of our right wing, only eight voted in favor, and uh, five um, voted uh, uh, three, uh, five voted against, and the rest did not vote. So that praise, that uh, support to Constitution, in the best possible case, is. Uh, Ancillary. So the transition, that, the transition that was also, according to them, betrayed, was a uh, process where the left-wing uh, powers tried to, to determine uh, how to finish, how to end uh, Franco's dictatorship, and, 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 and to bring democracy. It was a uh, complex period. We were able to bring democracy, but we have to uh, understand that the state the mechanisms were highly penetrated by the uh, by Franco's dictatorship left over. So we uh, went through a very convulsive period. At that moment is when we had uh, the, uh, att the the attempt of coup d'état of 1981, where. The, 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 the military forces were about to end democracy and with many in to end the lives of many Demo Democrats. Finally, we had to reach the year 2007 to approve, to pass the first law on democratic memory. This is a law which certainly was not enough. No, it was not sufficient because, on the one hand, the state did not fully accept the management on the exhumation of victims. The state declared, well, no, it didn't declare the, the nullity of the sentences of Frankism, plus other defects. But we have to understand that it was a starting point so that actions could be started on the area of exhumation or the elimination of the remains, the remains of. of well, or, or, the, or, or the names of, of certain streets that were still that still reminded uh, Franco's time, and it uh, was a booster so that 13 uh, autonomous communities uh, could dictate their own laws of democratic law. That uh, are still active. The situation right now is, as you can see in the map. I'll start. Or, well, I will start by saying those that did not approve the laws of democratic memory because we'll finish even sooner. Galicia, Madrid, Castilla-La Mancha, and Murcia did not approve the law of historic uh, memory. Three did. Uh, the, all the rest did. Well, it's, uh, well, apparently, Madrid is one of the uh, regions that need not um, pass a law on historic uh, or democratic memory having been the capital of reference of the resistance to the coup d'etat in Madrid, well, unfortunately, we do not have a law of democratic memory in Madrid. This is one. Well, this is um, this has been uh, overcome because the new law gathers the rest parts of the country, but. It indicate, but it also indicates that in those areas, maybe it'll be more difficult to apply the new 
norm, the New York Road, with all this big legislative effort that took place as a consequence of all these uh, rules and regulations in the different regions. Well, we see that the, the problems were not fully solved because the autonomous regions do not have the right competences in fundamental areas of democratic memory. That's to say, necessarily, the, we had to have a state law that just arrived with law 2022. So this new law, 2022, is the result of an agreement between the political parties, uh, the Socialist and Unidas Podemos. And in their agreement, in point, I believe, 5-7, there is um, section on the recovery of democratic memory. It is true, however, that we already had the experience of the regions, the autonomous communities, so there was already a pressure, uh, a line of uh, legislative development on democratic memory, but uh, it was with this coalition government between the Socialist Party and the left-wing Unidas Podemos when there was finally the, the proper basis for a new law. So what's the new law about? With a gross summary, I'll say a few words, although my colleague, uh, Judge Garzón, has already talked about the contents. So I'll be very brief on this. First, the victims of the coup d'etat and the dictatorship are recognized, and both crimes are rejected. This is article number one. This is the starting point. Then they establish the principles of truth, justice, reparation, and guarantees for no repetition. And that same article, number two, tells us how the laws need to be interpreted. The judges, they say, have to interpret the law in compliance with the international law on human rights, which means sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? They're telling the judges how they should interpret the law. I mean, is there any other way of interpreting the law which doesn't respect international law? Well, then there is a definition, a detailed definition of victims. And they talk about the illegal and absolutely null uh, character of the rulings and sanctions of the courts in uh, the Franco's times, and they illegalize the Special Court for Repression of Communism and Masons and the so-called Court of Public Order. Then there is uh, another point on remembering the victims, another point on the state census, we've already heard of it, state census of victims, and Article 7 of the law talks about the recognition of people who fought for freedom. And that takes us to point number eight, which is crucial. Point number eight of the law. The state is the leader in the quest for the identification and the tracing of the disappeared people. This is no longer in the hand of private individuals, which is what the previous law in 2007 had established. No, it is now the state which has to clearly lead this task, which is an essential task for democratic memory. The law states that the administrative and judicial authorities have to declare the findings of uh, remains to the fiscal ministry to study the possibility of crimes. It creates the uh, state attorneys, uh, special state attorneys for human rights and democratic memory. It creates the idea of reparation for uh, seized goods with a two procedures. First, an audit has to be done on the, the pillaged goods and assets, and then the possibility of implementing different channels to offer reparation to those affected. So there is a, a long path ahead of us, which will have to be walked. 
Another point, uh, Spanish nationality is granted to the volunteers of the Brigadas Internacionales, the international brigades, putting removal of any symbols of the dictatorship, and the Article 15 bans public acts which could be a humiliation to victims, 16 inclusion of democratic memory in public teaching for teenagers, 17 memory places and the change of the regime of the Cuelga Muros and uh, the Democratic Memory Council is created. Now, is this a whole of the law? Well, if it isn't, it is a good starting point. It is a source, a seed on which to base the structure that we know as the Commission of the Truth which has been set up in many other contexts. So, what does my association think of this law? Well, we think it is a law which is a useful tool to put an end to impunity. I'm not saying it is a perfect tool which solves all problems, no way. I'm just saying it is a useful tool, and I base this on three reasons. First, it covers all the fundamental aspirations of victims and most of the memorialistic uh, associations. The second reason is that it establishes suitable procedures to implement it. And third, because it doesn't close the door to any potential evolution if aspects are found that have so, to do, what is left to do? We can expect difficulties in the implementation of the law for two main reasons, because of a judiciary which is quite reluctant to its implementation. It's not very sensitive to democratic memory tasks. It is reluctant when it comes to implement international human rights law. And second, because we have a very uh, combatant right wing, which is going to make the implementation of this law as difficult as they can. We believe that those are the main challenges for the law. Not the text itself, which we believe is interesting, it's comprehensive. We believe it has potential. We believe that the difficulty will be the implementation. Because of what I just said, uh, we are bound to come across an opposition from these two groups I just mentioned. That's why we believe that we need to work in two different main lines. First, the administration needs to quickly, urgently set up the right measures to specify the law. For example, give it the right budget for exhumations for the new uh, state attorney. We believe that simple and open procedures need to be established for citizens to demand the implementation of this law. We need to act. I mean, the law is great news. And just the other day, the uh, government opened a file just one minute, if I may, on the demonstrations that have just recently been held on the last 20th in a typical Francoist date. Second point, we need to develop two campaigns, programs for uh, awareness uh, raising of democratic values. And we need to fight to reactionary mantra. First, 
the reactionary idea or, oh, let's sleeping lie, lions lie. No, let's not open the wounds from the past. No, we believe that the only people who can close those wounds are the victims. And the ones who are saying now that we shouldn't open those wounds are the perpetrators. That is shameful. The second mantra is that, no, we don't have time for this law now. We have all the most Im more important issues, inflation, and unemployment. No, no, we are absolutely in favor of fighting inflation and unemployment. But bread is not incompatible with justice. And it's not just that it's compatible, it's complementary. Finally, if you have no justice, you have no bread, you have no peace. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Carlos, for this brief uh, revision. Apologies for being so strict with my timekeeping, but uh, yeah, we, we are tight on time. I'm now going to give the floor to Sonia Olivella, who is a member of the Board of Ateneo Popular. She's a specialized lawyer in criminal law and human rights law. She coordinates historical memory in the strategic court case of Iridia, and she's been lately much publicized in the media because she's preparing a court case by Carlos Vallejo on the new law of democratic memory. Thank you. Thank you, Rosana, for your presentation. And thank you for inviting us to this panel with so many illustrious speakers. As representative of a body from uh, the civil society, Ateneo Popular is a body which has many members who work on uh, memory in Catalonia. We have been trying to also have our voices heard in the new law. And I must say that we are very happy that the process was started and we are very happy that the law is being implemented. I'm going to try and focus on some of the elements which for us stand out or which for us are most important, apart from the uh, wonderful presentations we've already heard on the new law. As I was saying, from the Ateneo, from our members, we celebrate this breakthrough, this new law. The final text is a considerable step forwards versus the initial draft, and that is thanks to the Democratic Party's work with their debate and their raising of the standard, despite the extreme right, which always works there, trying to bring things down. And I think memorialistic associations and victims associations have to be recognized for their excellent work particularly considering the scarce resources they have. They've done their best to improve this law. So we celebrate this breakthrough, particularly comparing the law in 2007, which was already quite innovative. In fact, it was the first one, but it, it had many lacunae, as it was proven. Now, we want to focus on some of the key elements for us in the law. First, the definition of victim. There is a clear, wide, generous definition of victim in the law. They cover an intersectorial and gender perspective, which is important, and they recognize not uh, the so-called just uh, uh, people who suffer reprisals uh, and other groups of victims. Another important breakthrough, which we believed was difficult, but it was obtained, is the time element. This is very important in the law. It doesn't just cover Franco's times. It's not up until when the dictator died. No, it goes beyond that. It covers the transition years. It admits something which is evident, but it, which it's good to have it recognized in a law, and it's that during the transition, human rights were violated. And uh, that is enshrined in the new law. The new law also is a considerable improvement 
improvement versus the previous one on gender perspective, not just in Article 3, in definition of victims, but also in other articles. For example, they talk about collectives which have been historically neglected, even silenced, because of the reprisals they suffered and the role in their struggle to obtain uh, democratic rights for everybody. For example, references is made to the Roma community, the LGTBI community, and there is an article, not just as victims, of specific reprisals of women, but uh, mention is made that a special effort must be made to look into the struggle of women and their relevant role to achieve the democratic principles that now rule our lives and which we celebrate. There are other points which previous speakers have already mentioned, for example, the issue of graves that was shameful in Spain. And finally, it is now established that it is up to the state. The state ex officio has to lead this work. They have to open graves. They have to exhume those remains. They've been waiting for years, those victims. Apart from those improvements, something else we say is that the text of the law establishes basis. It opens up the possibility for, in the future, uh, to implement future public memory policies, which should be up to the level of what is found elsewhere. So, as we just heard, it opens new possibilities. It closes no doors. So, uh, as Judge Garzón was saying, we remain there expectant to see how the law is going to be developed. I think that there are many, many articles which point to the right direction, but it remains to be seen how the law is going to be implemented and regulated. For us, that's where we believe that mm, we need to keep a close eye on things. For example, something we cel celebrated at the Ateneo, because one of our members is former political prisoners, and they've been working very hard for years to make sure that their history reaches uh, school books, textbooks, and they've been fighting from civil society without, no st without state support. And now, finally, the law states that this part of the history will be taught in our history textbooks and young people will learn of it. But it remains to be seen how this is going to be developed, implemented and what funds are going to be assigned to it. And then another point is uh, memory places, Article 49, 50 and 51 on memory places. I mean, the articles are there, they're great, they're really well drafted, they're a wonderful seed. Let's see how they're implemented. Article 49 means that ex officio, uh, it can be declared that a uh, repression symbol for, symbol, for example, the police uh, uh, station in Via La Yetana can be declared in something illegal and it has to go, become a memory symbol. I mean, it is clear this needs to happen, but it remains to be seen what happens with Via La Yetana. And the same thing happens with the illegality of the rulings and the courts. That is a great breakthrough. Those courts are now illegal, and therefore their rulings are null and void. But as our members have been saying, uh, the nullity or the declaration of illegality for some courts without it having in legal repercussions, this is useless. We need to see how this is going to affect the people who were uh, condemned, who were, whose lives were affected, their private lives and their association lives. So we need to see what claims can be made now. Apart from the huge breakthroughs, uh, uh, let me now go back to memorialist associations, which at the end of the day is the members I represent, we want to also talk about what the law might mean in terms of justice. We have publicly stated our doubts that the law may serve to break away from the model of Spanish immunity, what we call the uh, impunity model. I agree with what has already been said by the other speakers. It gathers, 
international human rights law. It makes reference to other things that have been said in international bodies, uh, the UN rapporteur, etc. Yes, that's fine, but we are still skeptical, me and the people I represent. We're not sure that this law is going to really serve a purpose to make sure that claims uh, against uh, the rulings in uh, Franco's times uh, to proceed. We believe that this is not going to happen, and this is because the courts we have at the moment, well, the jurisprudence they have is what it is, and that is because of the legal framework that was already there. I mean, the international law, international human rights law, has to be applied. We all know that, and that already used to happen before. And nevertheless, judges and courts, because of our ruling, which everybody is familiar with, with from 2012, they blocked the possibility of a having court cases against those crimes against humanity, against mankind. So we criticize the fact that the law hasn't been ambitious enough to force the Spanish judiciary to have to implement international law and for them to have to look into Francoist times uh, uh, crimes. I mean, I won't go into it because this is boring for non uh, legal experts. This could have been further developed, the issue of amnesty. I mean, we don't even need to derogate things. I mean, international law was already there. This is a lost opportunity. This law needs to be interpreted. And obviously, the case, the element of uh, crimes not having prescription, that is clear. But we believe the weak element is the implementation of the application of international law. We've already presented our first case after many cases, but this is the first one after the new law. We obviously mention the law and every all the legal avenues it opens, and we'll see what happens. I'm sure it's not going to be the last legal complaint, but so far there have been over 80 legal complaints in state. There hasn't been a single proper inquiry, and we remain fearful that this law is going to change nothing. Hopefully, we might be wrong. But at least we are hopeful because they do make special reference to international law and human rights legislation. José Luis Muñoz said something which is interesting, that the law says it says that forgetting is not an option for democracy, absolutely, in terms of uh, the right to truth the, uh, and the right to justice. The law uh, can make a huge contribution to the Spanish state, but let us not forget that impunity is not an option either for a democracy. So we need to keep fighting. Any breakthroughs in this sense will be welcome. The right to um, truth, justice, the reparation and the guarantee for no repetition they are all essential, but all of them, if a single one of them fails, they all fail. So inquiries in those crimes have to be made, and that is going to have an impact on all other rights. All those rights are essential. So we're going to wait. I mean, the text is there. It is promising. Nevertheless, there are legislative measures that can be, take, can be taken and could be very positive. So let's see if there is a particular judge or court who is going to be bold enough, I'd say. Yeah, they need to be bold enough to apply international law as ratified by the Spanish state in order to move forwards. Thank you. Thank you.
Sonia, for all your contributions in representation of your members, uh, uh, memorialistic associations. And thank you for your excellent timekeeping. Ramon, she's uh, left the bar really high. So do your best. We're now going to listen to Ramon Albert. He is the co-founder and uh, chairperson for Archiveros Sin Fronteras, Archivists Without Borders. He has represented Spain in many world forums. He's been a consultant for the International Center for Democratic Memory in Colombia. He's been a consultant in document management for uh, peace reconstruction in Colombia. In September 2022, he was given the federal Hello, ICA, which is the top recognition of the international archivists' body. So it is an honor to have you with us. The floor is all yours. Thank you. I'll try to keep up with the pace and uh, intensity, which my predecessor, Sonia, has left very high. Uh, I want to thank, obviously, uh, the Roman the organizers for their kind invitation to be here uh, and to address you a few words on archives. First, I must say that Reading the law, I can see, obviously, there is specific mention, chapter 1, section 2 talks about archives, and there are many other points of the law which uh, refer to archives as uh, an essential tool to achieve the aim of the law. For this, I must stress that there is a direct link between the organization of the archives and the positive results that could be obtained in all these different fields. So the archives are there, the centrality of the archives is there, and the law itself, if you read it in all its specific mentions, makes it clear. It talks about organized archives having positive results. And this is the usual problem in all fields, as Sonia and the previous speakers were saying, but when it comes to implementing this properly, we are going to need resources and continuity. I tend to joke around and say that um, archivists, uh, being an archivist is the only profession where, uh, by the time you join the profession, you already have five 500 years to catch up with. I mean, really, there is a lot to be done. It's not just a joke. There is an awful lot to be done. We're running very late as archivists. So no matter how, man, how many resources we are given, I mean, look at all the military archives, all the historical archives. We could benefit so much from them if only we had the resources. So the law, uh, as we heard from José Luis Muñoz and Gerard Gurbella and Alex Peña and Eulalia Mesayas, uh, as we heard from all of them, uh, the census of victims itself, uh, uh, whether it works out or not, is going to depend on archives and how well they're organized and how well funded they are. So the archives play a key role, and um, archives are mentioned in the law, clearly. Now, considerations I'd like to add. First, a general consideration and then three minor points. My most relevant comment is to do with uh, something which is omnipresent when we talk about archives, memory, uh, rights and justice. I'm talking about the open free universal access. Internationally speaking, there are recommendations from the United from UN, UE, the European Union, the international body of archivists. Uh, there are all sorts of recommendations which we could follow. I mean, the framework is clear. But then, in reality, we have a myriad of regulations which 
Apart from the goodwill expressed in the law, brings about a series of complications. We have the law of judicial regime, the law of data protection, the law of uh, freedom of information, the law of historical heritage. I mean, there are a whole series of laws which reference access and which mean that we need to have a very cross-cutting uh, outlook particularly for those of us who are not jurists, that they really pose a challenge to our basic aim. The law in Article 57, the law of historical heritage, tries to go beyond what the Spanish Constitution says on state security, protection of, of uh, private uh, information, personal details. I mean, there's always this basic difficulty, these basic obstacles that we have to Live with. Now, I'm not a jurist, so far be it from me to say what should be done in legal terms, but within the law, I believe that they could have covered something that was suggested by Spanish archivists, together with other 50 memorialist associations and archivists' associations and victims' relatives. I mean, we presented 14 well presented uh, pages of suggestions for the law. Some of our suggestions were he did, others were it. Yes, uh, it was referenced, which was one in particular where his um, bodies requested was the list of documentary and funds that were crucial, uh, historic uh, memories and military archives, public order, all that has to do with the law of a vague written thox. Maybe this is not the right place to develop uh, uh, this topic in, in particular, but maybe we could have uh, uh, spoken about uh, the most relevant historic funds that in, apparently it seems, it seems like <coughs> they should have a free uh, universal access. In some cases, you'd find uh, certain interpretations uh, in different areas. Uh, it's part of the fact that this is a very open uh, profession uh, that follows a free access in many cases. And that, in principle, this could seem like uh, was accessible. Uh, well, uh, this is a positive comment that can be done with the further development. How it may be protected is big uh, historic uh, document uh, funds that by its own definition are free of access. Had we supported this, uh, we, would have, we would have avoided uh, abusive interpretations. For example, a friend of mine mentioned to me that she suspected that she had been adopted or uh, stolen from, from uh, the, the mother. Um, and uh, she realized in certain sectors that uh, reading of the law said that you are not affected by this. And she was asking, I was not asking that I am a, a, an affected person. I want to know if I am, whether or not I am affected. Well, this kind of proves this idea, you see, so much atomized uh, legislation uh, maze and it, that makes it impossible to find answers. <laughs> Maybe this uh, amendment or this consideration could have been introduced together with these five associations work. Well, other uh, considerations not of the same level but the center, the Grand Center of uh, Historic Memory, in its definition as the place for memory, is very positive. Right now, this is uh, highly focused on, on memorials. And museums, museums maybe could be, uh, or should be considered a uh, place for of memory, uh, is, is a real uh, progress of law. Short ago, I read in the media that the, 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 the historic memory 
mucha capacidad de obrar, ¿no? Allows a wide range of big capacity of action. Una parte de la documentación la han trasladado al Archivo Histórico Provincial de Salamanca, que es competencia de la Junta, con lo cual cuando solicitas un documento lo tienen allí, tres meses de espera para el documento, porque no se ha hecho la inversión en infraestructuras necesarias para el documento. Enough investments have been made in the Ministry of Culture. The law evidences the need of a strong investment so that the potential of the law can be reflected in that sense because they've had to use another archive for them to keep part of their documents and then you had to go through a real maze to find these documents. Article number 26. The word didn't quite fit in acquisition of documents. Article is positive. We have to integrate as many documents from and sources. Well, the word acquisition entails an economic, a monetary connotation. People used to donate archives, and at a certain moment, this was part of well, sometimes the archives became monetized, and it was very difficult to, to buy. For example, the case of the, the sons of Augustus and Tegas being brought into the economic market, they said, who pays more for this? Well, do you want to pay more? You get the documents. But they sold. They sold the documents. Well, they put a price to memory. And this has been a bad present, uh, a negative uh, connotation, because many people would have considered a donation, and uh, now they think about money. Before we had been able, not only in Catalonia, but in many other places, to get uh, sessions and, and donations, and in exchange you would get uh, the public recognition and gratitude. So the word acquisition here has uh, an economic connotation. Maybe you could use terms such as donation, deposit, accession, uh, opening up to this citizen capacity of being generous in the effort of, and, 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 and helping, not just giving it uh, a more economic connotation. I have five more minutes. Article 26.6 archives and documents of the government of the dictatorship. Uh, are in the hands of private uh, bodies or, 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 or people that we have. Uh, if not the Franco Foundation, this article could uh, correct it. Juan Negrin Foundation, uh, the document, well, this, docu this, this, this fund has documents, uh, no one is free of, of uh, responsibility. In some cases, from the Felipe González Foundation, and different presidents, some of which part of the documents are accepted personally and taken home. We, in Catalonia, have our share of responsibility after Jordi Pujol's government and successively Pascual Maragall, José Montilla, Artur Mas, and so on and so forth. We've had the consolidated practice of transferring, transferring, nothing for free, but transfer. The, the archives to public archives, and here we have, unfortunately, an important anomaly, which is the uh, Josep Tarrellas archives. Not curiously, I was the director, there I couldn't change things. I, I was blamed by a part of the political establishment when I said that we should try to change things in a monastery, uh, in Mont Poblet. Well, they had uh, some, some private, some, some public uh, archives. A good part of the information at that time was or should have been in the hands of the government of Catalonia. And one month ago, we heard that documents were stolen, no, no, not really stolen because they were copied. Uh, because I say so because we heard that the, the family of Mr. Adolfo Suarez sold to the government part of the documents as they considered these documents as private uh, information. Law 
toca un elemento importante que es el tema de la eh, de, de quién son los archivos de los presidentes la referencia no, no es mal que esté pero yo lo otro día leyendo me la leí aprovechando que hace poco una entrevista de la presidencia de la presidencia se llama Yigay en la frontera ¿no es? un artículo dedicado a los archivos de los presidentes, una de las personas que escribía estos artículos, hace una referencia que tiene que ver el artículo 54 de la ley 56 de 1985 de Patrimonio Histórico, dice exactamente, dice, obliga a la transferencia de documentos para aquellos que se hacen cargo públicos y remacha este carácter de que toda persona que ejerce este carácter de un cargo de carácter público tiene que ceder los archivos a la institución. Por tanto, en este caso, no sé si en algún momento valdría la pena dar la cuenta de que desde Carlos Arias Navarro hasta el último gobierno ha habido esta anomalía y la ley hace bien en hacer mención a la institución is doing a good thing, which is mentioning the ownership uh, public of these archives to reframe the importance of law or Article 54 of this law that determines who are the owners of these documents. And we should also consider that in the framework of a possible law of archives in Spain, that would be an important case to locate and work more in them to avoid the repetition of these uh, phenomena of privatization of public documents in the hands of foundations or other private institutions. That's it. Thank you very much. Good, uh, Ramon. Thank you for your presentation. And finally, we have Mr. Carlos Jiménez Villarejo. Difficult to, to introduce a person who is so well known. His uh, work as an attorney, he was a judge, he was a, an active militant in PESUC. Bueno, en la lucha por and, las libertades uh, en este país. And his fight against the, the freedoms or in, pro, in favor of the freedoms y, in this country. And that marked the rest of his uh, professional career defending humanos. human rights. Así que sin so with no further ado, gracias, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Jiménez Villarejo. And you have the floor, sir. Chicas, y buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Eh, thank you very much. Por la presencia de for todos nosotros y vosotros en este acto. Y mi gratitud and my a la Secretaría de Estado de la Unión Memory por haberme invitado a participar en este panel. La verdad es que me he sentido muy satisfecho y honrado de ver a los panelistas y sobre todo por el tema que nos ha invitado a todos, que es el tema de la memoria. Democratic. Democratic memory. Uh, I wanted to start my intervention, which will be brief, with some words of Reyes Mate, which are very meaningful. Let's imagine an old injustice, and if it's not compensated, it will still be there, hidden or latent, waiting for a moral consciousness that awaits it up. This footprint will be there, accompanying history, because history has been built on top of it. And this has happened de la muerte del after the death of the dictator for many years until finally the law 2022 of the Marshall de Memory Law was passed. But we are celebrating here. So many, many years have gone by. Too many. I would say 44 years after the Constitution of 1978. Años después, quickly said, de la Constitución democrática uh, after, que abre un nuevo periodo 44 years after, en la España en que vivimos. Uh, Well, we get Yo, dicho this esto, quería this, I a to, uh, reproducir algunas palabras del preámbulo de la ley, que son muy significativas y hay que decirlas en voz para que valoremos lo que significa la ley. Las políticas públicas de memoria democrática deben recoger y canalizar las aspiraciones de la sociedad civil e incentivar la participación ciudadana y la reflexión social y reconocer la dignidad de las víctimas de toda forma de violencia intolerante violence and fanatic violence. I was asking, after reading this text for the first time, why 
y lo dice el preámbulo. Well, the preamble la respuesta it. So, es muy evidente. The is very porque no puede construirse nuestra historia actual a partir del, del preámbulo desde el olvido y el silenciamiento de los vencidos. Son palabras fundamentales para entender lo que ha significado esta ley de memoria democrática que hoy celebramos aquí tan importante. Yo quería hacer algunas citas muy concretas que van a concluir en el plazo establecido para todos y por tanto lo quiero quiero reproducir. En primer lugar, yo quiero reproducir la relevancia que tiene el párrafo eh, del artículo 2.3 de la ley, en la que se hace referencia a la ley de amnistía del 77 y al Pacto Internacional de Derechos Civiles y Políticos de 1977, es decir, unos meses antes de la aprobación de la ley de amnistía por el gobierno ya pre-democrático, podríamos decir, de Adolfo Suárez. Eh, yo creo que están en relación con el artículo 10.2 de la Constitución, porque garantizan el derecho a la verdad y a la justicia de las víctimas de graves violaciones de los derechos humanos y del derecho internacional humanitario. Y a continuación concluye diciendo, porque todas esas violaciones, más la tortura, más la tortura, más la tortura son imprescindibles y no amnistiables, o que no sea objeto de una amnistía. Un largo debate doctrinal y lo que es doctrinal desviado a veces de los verdaderos objetivos que se pretenden. Por tanto, me parece que es importante recordar, recordar. La importancia que tiene esta, este artículo 2.3 de la Ley de Memoria Democrática porque sienta un precedente fundamental para el futuro de la valoración y análisis de las resoluciones que se dicen. Yo quiero con esto además recordar eh, lo que representa esta afirmación que es evidente por otra parte y que ya era evidente hace ya muchísimos años, muchísimos años. Eh, incluso ya en los años finales de la, de la dictadura, eh, cuando en, en democracia, en democracia, el Tribunal Supremo dicta una sentencia, algunos de los que están aquí la recuerdan, la sentencia 101 barra 2012, ¿eh? en la que se afirma que no se puede investigar las desapariciones forzadas de personas eh, porque eran hechos Because sin imputados, facts that could not no be mediaba, hasta ese momento no había mediado ninguna investigación, sin imputados, with no people porque affected. esto Because se supone que fallecieron, posición absolutamente infundada, o porque en todo caso esos delitos derivados de esas desaparecidas forzadas estaban prescritos o anunciados. Esto se decía por el Tribunal Supremo, por la Sala Segunda del Tribunal Supremo, el año 2012 eran resoluciones claramente prevaricadoras como otras tantas pero no ha habido manera de que el Ministerio Fiscal reaccione como tenía que haber reaccionado en su día para hacer frente al carácter prevaricador de determinadas resoluciones contra la investigación de los crímenes de la investigación de los crímenes de la investigación de los crímenes de la de la importancia que tiene el capítulo segundo de la justicia, de la ley, cuando crea la Fiscalía Especial para la Investigación por la consecuente persecución penal de las violaciones de derechos internacionales de derechos humanos y de derecho internacional humanitario. Me parece que es la primera vez que se constituye un Ministerio Fiscal al servicio auténtico de la justicia y, por tanto, se permite que el Ministerio Fiscal, ante la omisión de la etapa anterior, eh, pueda actuar para investigar abiertamente los delitos derivados de la relación de hechos victimarios que se describen en el artículo, creo que punto, artículo 2.1 o algo así, eh, donde se describen los 13 supuestos de personas que han sido objetos de agresiones eh, desde, contra el derecho a la vida hasta la right de carácter estrictamente profesional. Por tanto, me parece que tiene una una trascendencia enorme que el Ministerio Fiscal, fiscal a partir de este momento, after this moment, de este after momento, this very moment se ha creado, ¿no? Know, it was no sé, eh, 
constituya un instrumento fundamental a, a en la recuperación de la memoria democrática memory, y en la persecución y castigo and formal and formal de aquellas personas que hicieron posible la catástrofe que la dictadura y el Yo pienso, por ejemplo, en que tenemos todavía ejemplos que están ahí perdidos en la memoria, memory, pero me estoy pensando en los magistrados integrantes the, de la sala de los militares del Tribunal Supremo Supreme Court, uh, que en 46 the, uh, the resoluciones 46 resoluciones the Department que rechazaron that in 46 resolutions los recursos de revisión que los familiares de las personas que han sido that had been executed the by the imposition of death penalties in the uh, asked nullity sentences of death trials celebrated in the period of the war during those court martials that were totally fascist in nature. Familiares well, when de aquellas we have personas relatives of those people that were executed in, in the, de la uh, at the end of the Civil War, beginning of the 1930s, ilegales, in court martials that were totally illegal and absolutely alien to any principle of legality, pues bien, la sala de los militares del Tribunal well, Supremo the, the rechazó revisar aquellas those sentences de guerra que habían dictado las penas de muerte, uh, eh, invocando razones de orden formal. Estamos hablando formal, ya de un periodo que se ha situado en los años 90, uh, en, los años 90 en la que la sala de los militares del Tribunal Supremo está amparando la legalidad de los consejos de guerra de los años 40, con la absoluta falta de principios democráticos y principios morales y que, sin embargo, ha pasado prácticamente desapercibido. Yo me pregunto si no merecería alguna referencia en algún momento la ley de la reconsider democrática, the law of momento, democratic no o law when, uh, whenever this is reviewed or revisited, to also revisit those legal decisions in democracy that was a radical attack against the principles of justice that should uh, head uh, the actions of any tribunal. court. Dicho esto, yo quería Having también hacer this, referencia a like to make a reference todo esto explica, to the fact that this explains and movemos otra vez hacia atrás. We are going some eh, steps, we're moving some pues steps. Anoche veía back, un documental en la entrevista looking española at a documentary on Spanish TV about the Nazi concentration camps. Speaking about eh, Anna Frank, yo me pregunto a veces, I sometimes wonder, ¿por qué no hay más documentos we don't have more documentaries y se proyectan durante dos horas el documental? Two hours of information about the Nazi concentration camps, of what the repression meant, the, what the, 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 the Franco, Franco's repression, the fascist repression meant, with other concentration camps we also had here, and forms of repression that were practiced during the beginning of uh, the uh, beginning of the Civil War up to the year 1975. That's a problem, and we'll see how this can be solved. The problem. Mm, alguna sí, duda que yo creo que está generate some, some question marks in, in my mind cómo I mean, the mind of others is how the transfer of the violación, concept of de violation of, uh, de los, de los of international treaties on human rights and the right well, how, how did the transfer of this concept that is uh, part of the uh, law and democratic memory how this was transferred to the, to the penal code the, that should be implemented by the fiscal ministry when acting as, as, as attorneys and as members of the uh, legal apparatus uh, legal machinery as we call it and those violations of human rights have a correspondence uh, and a reference, which is Article 6.7, uh, which uh, speaks about crimes against humanity. Uh, we all know about this. So we should take some steps. Uh, no sé si corresponde a la fiscalía. I don't know if it's up to the attorney's office that was recently created para la defensa de los derechos de las personas víctimas, la violación de los derechos humanos y el derecho internacional general, para ajustarlo a su correspondiente penal. 
eh, que es el artículo 600, article 607 que yo cito aquí porque me parece importante. Yo quería además añadir algo y voy terminando porque creo que me estoy extendiendo um, más de lo necesario than, than de que But I would like to finish by saying that se constituye when, uh, um, el, esta fiscalía this, especial uh, tan relevante que office yo, was, el de la Fiscalía de Sala de los Derechos Humanos y de la Memoria Democrática, created, que es como se denomina, um, and, and que se acuerde ya well, y sin demora alguna, y más después de los datos que ha proporcionado nuestra compañera Sonia sobre los our, procedimientos uh, que hay en trámite de esta naturaleza, que se aplique, que se actúe Sonia ya offered, sobre los procedimientos en trámite the, uh, que hay, que son muchos, ¿eh? que son muchos, ella lo ha dicho, me parece que ha dicho 80 procedimientos uh, en trámite, uh, uh, pudieran ser más, en manas, maybe even more. pero yo lo que quiero es really dar una like destacada is importancia uh, en este the, momento the right a, a lo que me corresponde como fiscal y como ciudadano, por otra parte, más como ciudadano como fiscal, que es a la persecución de la tortura. Which is the prosecution of torture, against torture, that was the last manifestation of a dictatorship in the last years. Yo lo he examinado y lo he analizado en el libro de Gabo de Ricard. Y ahí están, ahí están los nombres de muchos de los torturadores. Por qué torture? I will read them in some way to step down to reality. In that chapter dedicated to the analysis of the Sixth Brigade of Barcelona, which is what we analyze through the archives of Commission of the Union and Fundación Zavirano García, there we have dirigentes de la policía eran dos dirigentes de la policía y al mismo tiempo torturadores, Saturnino Yagüe González. Eduardo Quintela, Eduardo Quintela, Juan Estevez, Juan Estevez el comisario Ballesteros, comisario Ballesteros en Valencia, el jefe de policía de Tenerife, de Tenerife José, Matute, José Matute, González Pacheco, González Pacheco Carlos Domínguez, Carlos Domínguez el Eutario Fernández Girón, el, Eutario Fernández el Girón, inspector, Pena, inspector Pena y los hermanos Antonio, Vicente, brothers, Antonio Juan Vicente Juan Cresh. Eh, y esto... And this, um, y esto por situarlos en un periodo concreto histórico que va desde julio del 75 hasta diciembre del 76. En ese periodo se detuvieron a 5.585 personas. Todas ellas, mayor o menor, All of them, with greater or lesser intensity, were victims of torture. Yo pregunto, and I would like to know, wouldn't it be a good thing to determine the the el poner en marcha ya los procedimientos penales de persecución de los delitos de tortura que se cometieron por estos miembros de la sociedad política y social de la dictadura sobre las víctimas que lo fueron y muchas entre ellas el actual más inmediato que fue el actual presidente del de la Asociación de Expresos Políticos de Franquismo, Caleb Vallejo, que acaba de presentar como Estado una querella por tortura a las torturas que sufrió en la sede de la Brigada de Protección Social de Miles de Tarra. Todo esto lo digo porque creo que es necesario bajar al terreno de la realidad inmediata que estamos viviendo ya. Y por tanto, espero que se vayan dando los pasos necesarios para que se pidan competencias para ello, no lo digo de esto. That, not me, obviously, in order to progress in the fulfillment and development of the so expected law on democratic memory. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much for such considerations. We are running 11 minutes late, but there are so many things on the table, things of interest that I am forced to, with the permission of the organizers or whoever has to close, to give some minutes for debate just in case there are any questions that will need to be considered. Hola, buenos días. Hello, good morning. I would like to ask a question with respect to the law 
Amnesty. Law Amnesty from 1977 has an article, article number 9, that clearly states that uh, amnesty will be determined by a judge. <coughs> and so when a judge faces uh, the need to implement this rule, will check that the facts that are, uh, that are affecting a person are part of the implementation of law and that the person that these facts uh, affect uh, follows into the, one of their circumstances determined by the law and consequently will determine amnesty. But law has never interpreted in that respect. We always heard that the law on amnesty won't allow to investigate the facts because you are implementing the law before you determine that it's applicable. Why has this article never been uh, applied as one should suppose? <coughs> I understand that this is uh, addressed to me, but uh, whoever well, has an no answer should answer it as well. Well, well the law uh, was implemented as uh, it was interested interesting to, to some, and it was like a, like a full stop. Uh, the judges uh, really uh, did not research. They had, they should have researched that they should have investigated when a posteriori they determined if the fact was included in the, within the law of amnesty. This was not done. It was changed, however, because we began doing that. Uh, as, using this opportunity that uh, well, being uh, under this law of democratic memory, this should not be so, this article should not be so, but we will see that it will still continue being so. This is the really serious problem, one of the big serious problems of this law. That is that this is a law that, which is good, but that depends on the will of those that should implement it. And this law suggests something that has been mentioned here. Why do I have to tell the judges what they have to do? Well, obviously, as uh, attorney Jiménez Villarejo, the judges have not done what they should have done. And in Spain, they didn't do that because they didn't want to do that, and because the Supreme Court decided, in the sentence that we mentioned, dictated in the case against me, for example, where they absolved me, but they say, poor guy, he uh, made it wrong in the interpretation. I said, no, I didn't, make, uh, I didn't misinterpret it. At least, uh, oh, I, well, it's been proven that this was the right interpretation. They made a mistake or wanted to make a mistake, evidently. This was the case. The interpretation made by the Supreme Court is totally contrary to any of the principles that international right of human rights and the humanitarian rights determine, something which is very, uh, well, very applicable to the Spanish courts. The concept of human rights is not clear in their minds. Not, it was not clear in any that uh, was not the, interpret, the classical interpretation, positivist interpretation, and ultra-conservative now they have to start doing something, and here we'll have a con an important, very important contradiction. There's a, a gap between the, 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 the attorney's office that determines, or the prosecutor's office that determines some competencies that will, will generate some kind of a revolution if we consider the interpretation of judges and convince that will be totally opposed to what we heard. Nothing is happening. Uh, this prescribes here we, uh, the law of honesty is applied or, or it's not applied. We will have the further research. Why? Well, because we still need to include the concept of restorative justice. Uh, this not only is, uh, happens in the penal sphere, but it involves the right to do investigation, the right to truth. It's placing the victim right at the core, as I said before, which changes the paradigm. I think we're probably 
going to have to end up in the European Court for Human Rights, which is one of the competitions that is established for the Court Attorney for Democratic Members. Up until now, the European Court for Human Rights, when we, I used to take cases to it, cases for economic reparation or reparation in the sense of the right to inquest, uh, the European Court said, no, we can't go into that because that is about facts when there was no normative that established the existence of the European Court of Human Rights. Well, now that's going to have to change because the current law, the current law, right now establishes the obligation of inquest, the obligation of finding the truth the, or looking for it, the obligation of administering justice. So if a Spanish judge doesn't do that, there will be a case for the victims or for the state attorney, and it will be their duty, because that's what they have to do in coordination with the European Court of Human Rights. For me, that's essential. And finally, on the cases already open, the problem we have on those is that um, they will go to the supervision or the report of the state attorneys without there still being a court attorney uh, in the implementation of the law. So what we can find if that is that if the state attorney doesn't establish immediately establishing the action lines for this implementation, there will be a scattering uh, uh, and there will be discrepancies according to the area or the individual state attorney. And that would be a shame. I mean, there will be a delay in the creation of the court attorney. And that is crucial because that is going to play a key role in the actual implementation for the law and for these cases which are already open. So it's not that this implementation is urgent. It is absolutely uh, extremely urgent. The law establishes short periods of time in the benefit of the victims, but that also means that if things take too long, this is actually going to turn against the interest of the victims. So the current government has the duty to implement this speedily because the timeline starts from the day after the law was approved. So the clock is ticking. If there is a, a timeline established of six months or one month, that's already ticking. It doesn't say when the government establishes all the regulations to implement the law. It says when the law is passed. Hello, good afternoon. I agree with the speakers that one of the main consequences of the law is going to be in the spaces of justice. That's clear. And that justice is going to have an effect on the actions of other agents, which are beyond the spaces of democratic memory, and that's how it is. And we have uh, jurisprudence, and we have rulings from the Supreme Court, and yeah, now we have a law which opens a door or a window to other interpretations. So I think that what is done in um, teaching, in training, in didactic, this is going to be very important. But, I mean, we've already got experiences in this. I was listening to Carlos with all my admiration, as usual, Master, and we have experiences where we have obtained some goals, like the retroactive application of criminal law. I mean, this could just be scary, yes, I know, but it has been done. It has been done, and I want to mention it. 
in Baltasar Garzón's uh, the judge, in his inquest in the crimes of the Argentinian dictatorship, that was a thorough uh, investigation. There were opportunities for the victims to express themselves, to present their case, and that contributed to the closure of those impunity spaces. The victims came to Spain, and we had the principle of universal jurisdiction, the possibility of uh, acting against cases all over the world, whatever the nationality of the victims of the, or the perpetrators. And Judge Garzón's work together with uh, the uh, claims of the victims and administrations was taken to court, and I had the honor of being the state attorney that worked on it. We presented a thesis, which was the retrospective application of crimes against humanity. So we applied crimes against humanity. And in the section two of the national court condemned Estlingo because of that uh, legal classification. It is true that then the Supreme Court took another, uh, had a different opinion. And they talked of something which was very interesting, which was that those facts were perpetrated within a context of crimes against humanity. Yes, it's true that there were specific personal votes and the ruling was controversial and it meant that it was much discussed at universities, but I'm not trying to be tremendously over-the-top optimistic, because uh, there is no call for that. But I do believe that things can be done. We now have a new tool, the law of democratic memory. It overrules the old one from 2007, but it is nevertheless a continuity of it. So things can be done if there is a will. If there is a will, and training and education and pedagogy. So within the pessimism of the speakers and within the expectations we have, we are aware of the obstacles and challenges. Nevertheless, I do believe this is an important law because it allows for pedagogy, for training, and we have tools for interpretation. But I'm also optimistic because I think this law has an inter international side. The the fact that the court attorney, which will have to work, will have to heed human rights law means that that is expansive and the victim has to be placed at the core of all inquests with the victim statute but also human rights are expansive, and they expand in all international bodies of uh, human rights. We see that in uh, different international levels. I mean, the field is huge, and not just nationally. Not just nationally, that's where we can find most of the challenges. I do remain deeply optimistic, being aware, obviously, of the challenges ahead of us. If I may, just one nuance. I am not pessimistic. I'm a realist. I always say that I am a positive uh, pessimistic. I think that it's hard to change things, but nevertheless, we have to try. I mean, realistic. The Supreme Court went against its own ruling, which we've already heard, in its ruling against me. I mean, it applied exactly the opposite of what it had already said. Why? Because, because, full stop. That was all there was to it. And uh, they went into things that were not of a legal judicial nature. And in 2012, in a ruling uh, in two different uh, uh, courts, 
They closed all possibility of an inquest and they left the victims uh, defenseless in a very cruel way, saying that they were actually defending them. So now, what I do not trust is the interpretation of ultra-conservative judges on this. What the law now facilitates, and that remains our work, is that there are things that can be done. Let's go for it. The door is now open to truth, to justice, to restorative criminal justice, if needs be. And that is the work that is left for us to do. It's not that I'm pessimistic. It's just that the battle ahead is going to be tough. Court uh, attorney, Gómez Villarejo. Yeah, not just one comment. I greeted somebody from Largo Caballero Foundation. Oh, he's left. Okay. Well, I wanted to say about everything that has been said, uh, something which is pretty objective, but which shows how a state can oppose the crimes of the past. Exactly a year ago, in November 2021, and the general director knows that because he said that before, in a city near Berlin, where there was a concentration camp, Sassenhausen, where, by the way, Largo Caballero was interned for two years, from 1943 to 45. Well, in the city near Berlin, there was a court, a, a case against somebody who was 100 years old because of his cooperation in the killing of 100 people in that concentration camp. That case was heard one year ago. And we're talking about facts that took place in 1945 during the Nazi regime. So, I think we should remain confident and hopeful and trusting of our judiciary and our democracy, hoping that what the democratic memory law establishes will be will be a really interesting presentation. I want to thank all the speakers, and I believe with this we can close the session.